everybody, it's Ricardo here at GDC, and I'm sitting here with Peter Molyneux. Hi, Ricardo. Hello, and for the first time in a really long time, he does not have a game to talk about, but that doesn't mean he's off the hook, because we're going to talk to you about Fable 2 really fast. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Fable 2's finished now, and it's, um, part of me always feels incredibly proud about what has been achieved, what the team has achieved. The other part of me thinks, hey, I've got my three-page list of points that, you know, we really should have done slightly better here and slightly better there, and... So that's it's kind of mixed emotions. What I have found ama- it's amazing is that the stories that people have about some of their experiences in, in, in Fable. And I, you know, just the interview before this, in fact, one journalist came up and said his wife had, had had this horrendous choice in the game and didn't get to give this toy wooden sword to her son in the game. And she broke down in tears and wow, that's a fantastic story. So I think Fable 2, you know, it was sort of little baby steps along a long, much longer road that we want to kind of take with, you know, things like making you feel connected to the world and questioning some of the mechanics that perhaps work well and perhaps don't. I, you know, I was, I've, I've been pretty critical about certain aspects of the game. And do you feel that it was received? It sounds like it's been received the way that you all expected, which is it's a very personal experience for people. Yeah, I mean, I think it... it, it it's an interesting. It's still a little bit, you know, a, bit, a little bit like. Um, but there's something in England called Marmite. You either love this food called Marmite or you hate it. And I think this is still true as fable. I think some people loved it, some people hated it. But I, you know, a lot more people seem to love it, and a lot more people found, you know, their own personal experience in there. I think a lot of fable too. If you if you sort of got into the right mindset, I think then people really, really loved it, you know, obsessively loved it. And there was a lot of people in the community that are give, really giving us really strong ideas of where, what we should do with anything in the future of Fable because they loved, you know, they were so passionate about the story and the world and Albion and Teresa, a character, and Reva, and, the, you know, there was people that, in the community that this, the Reaver character were demanding that we kill him off and that he had a horrendous death. And that is an amazing, amazing feeling to see that passion there. Now, what have you learned now that you've done, you've got two fables under your belt, mm. uh, both pushing different kind of mm. different envelopes. Uh, what have you learned about the process of making that style of game? Well, firstly, I think we need to spend more time polishing what we've got and uh, you know, I think it's right to what Fable did, two did, or Fable one is kind of distill things down and maybe reduce down the number of features, but the features that are there make them, you know, better and more, make more sense and more highly polished. So that's the first thing. So really focusing on, on uh, you know, the polishing that. The other thing is not to be scared of putting new stuff in there. You know, actually, I think. The new death mechanic in Fable, where you you know you don't you don't go back in time. I think that worked really well. I think the breadcrumb trail worked really well. I think the dog worked worked really well. I think all of those you know they, you, there's still room for a lot of improvement there. But if you, you know the future, anything on the future of, of Fable, um, I don't want to I don't want people to point at any game feature in the game and say, well that's definitely going to be there in the future. It's not. You know we'll keep on saying, you know, is this the right thing, and distilling down what we've got. Now, speaking of the future, you've mentioned, you know, these ideas you have for, for moving the series mm-hmm. forward and trying different things, but, you know, you're giving a talk uh, tomorrow, I believe, yeah. kind of about experimenting, and yeah. what I'm curious about is, do you feel, now that you've become Peter, the Peter Molyneux, right. that you have the freedom to really experiment and do whatever? Like, do you feel like you could go out and do a really off the wall, simple game? That's a really hard question to answer because there's a really answer, easy way to answer it. Because I would be able to talk about what's going on now. But I think now that there's a kind of a process to experimentation and to, to innovation and to having ideas off the side of all, and this is what my talk's all about, is if I have an idea or Anybody at Lionhead has an idea, and you know, guess what? You know, I don't have all the ideas. I don't probably have half the ideas. There are a lot of cool, amazing people that do. 
now there is a process to that so that you know that we can have ideas without it costing millions and gazillions of dollars and terrifying people who are you know further up the chain quite rightfully looking at you and saying hey what are you doing that for you well, you should be doing this then I feel more empowered than I've ever done you know I I'll be honest with you Ricardo I got to a pretty dark place a few years ago where my natural instinctive reaction was to have an idea and you know wake up in the morning and to run into work and say I've had another great idea let's all do this and when there's you know you when you've got teams of you know 20 30 40 50 people you know people were looking at me as if they wanted me to drop dead on the spot because the last thing they wanted was another great idea they wanted just you know the idea that was going to make you know just the process of finishing the game and that was that was pretty you know i felt very constrained by that but now now there is a a sort of kind of forum for the experimentation and the prototyping and that to you know be a safe place to experiment with i feel more empowered to be able to do the most bizarre most out there ideas and i think you know interestingly you're going to see the the product of that come forward very soon now you know i think lionhead's almost ready to start showing the world what happens when you feel safe about experimenting and inve in inventing and prototyping and that can lead to some some pretty amazing things and we've got some amazing things in our back pocket and speaking of the things that inspire you to do the amazing mm. things do you feel now that you've been doing this for just a little while yeah uh, do you, are you finding that the, the same things still inspire you or are new things inspiring you and taking the place of what you used <clears> to <throat> You know, there's a dream, Ricardo, there's a dream that I have had since I was a little tiny kid. And we're closer to that dream than from the day that I did Populous 20 years ago. But we're nowhere really near it. I think there's, I think what these, com these things are called, we call computer games have become are truly something which is amazing. And you, you start to, and I can start to see, and I bet you, if I, I make a bet with you, in the next two years, there is gonna be something that is gonna come out that is gonna feel like a world-changing event. You can feel it inside this industry now. You know, everything is changing at this point in time. The way computer games are made, who makes them, how they're sold, how they're distributed, what a computer game actually is, who interacts with them, how they interact, all of that is changing as we talk. And you talk, I think about myself in that mix, and I'm more excited today than I've ever been in my life. And I've got a dream and an ambition, and you know, I, I feel I'm walking there slowly, and, but there's still a long way to go. And how do you feel something like the recession is gonna affect the creative spirit, because Art and commerce have always been not mm, the best of friends, mm. and now with the economy being what it is, you know, commerce is kind of telling art to behave, right? Yeah. Well, there's two ways you can look at this recession. You can know there's a bad way, and it's bad for creativity, and it's bad for, you know, having those big games, or you can look at it as a kind of housekeeping. Look, computer games are here to stay. They, I'm not saying they're recession proof, they're not. They are incredibly good value entertainment, there's no doubt about that. And I think if I look at the Independent Games Awards yes, last, last night, and I look at some of the smaller teams, talented teams coming up with those really incredible ideas, I'm thinking, you know, these guys are spending tens of thousands of dollars, not, you know, tens of millions of dollars to make, you know, those experiences. That gives me an enormous amount of hope. The fact that we as an industry, if we are making these epic games, we have to, have to show value. We can't just keep on throwing millions of dollars down the drain just because we feel like we are creative people. That's not the answer here. The answer is, in times when it gets tough financially, you've just got to prove that you're creating something of good va that's good value, that you're not wasting money and you, you're creating it for, uh, for a really good reason. So I think the bright side of, the dark side of recession is there is going to be some casualties, there is some tough times, there's teams getting smaller, 
The good side it just means that we're going to have to be smarter and more inventive, and you know we can be. I'm absolutely sure. So I'm very optimistic, and I think the funny thing is that you're probably going to see more really smart, cute, clever ideas from the independent game in game community that's going to be that's going to be latched onto and nurtured by the bigger publishers than ever before because of the recession, and that's a good thing. And you're also going to see the bigger teams just working harder and smarter to create the, the content that they want. So, at the end of the, the day, I think it's, you know it's, it's all going to be fine. It's all going to be good. All right. Well, as we let you go, we do have to come back to Fable Two mm. one more time. Uh, we got some DLC for it not mm. too long ago. Is there any more coming? There is. Uh, it's called Seeing the Future. It's coming out in spring. Now we're in spring now, so you know it's not too far away. Here's the interesting thing about this DLC 2. It's not like DLC 1 at all. This is much more story driven. It's much, give you, if you're interested and fascinated in the Fables 2 story or the Albion world or where the story is going, then see the, you can play See the Future. There's a lot about Teresa in there. This, you know, new creatures, new costumes, all the things you'd usually expect, but it's the hints that it will give you about the future. That, that's why it's called Seeing the Future. All right, well, sounds pretty good. We will be looking forward to it. Great. And thank you, sir. And that is, that is our chat with Peter Molyneux from GDC.